Let's talk about good weapons and bad weapons, partially a response to Shadowversity. So recently I put a video up talking about the Klingon Batleth, pointing out that some people uh, in the world, um, various people I've known actually personally over the years, have pointed out what a rubbish weapon the Klingon from Star Trek Batleth is as a weapon. And I basically pointed out how maybe we're misjudging it in certain ways and actually within certain contexts and bringing in certain ethnographic and historic weapons. Actually, maybe it's not that bad after all. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second a little bit more. Um, as it happened, by pure coincidence, at the same time, um, Scal, Scalagrim, did a video also on the Klingon Batleth. And it was pure coincidence that um, I released my video actually after he'd already filmed his video and then he released his video, Scalagrim, this is. Now, um, I believe that uh, a video that um, Shadowverse's just put up about good or bad weapons and his uh, system or metric for analysing what is a good or bad weapon is partially a response to uh, Scal and my videos. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about the Klingon Batleth, but then I'm going to talk a little bit more about good or bad weapons and how, generally speaking, it's really silly in my view or rather kind of just a waste of energy a lot of the time trying to analyze whether something's a good or bad weapon in most cases of real world weapons anyway. Now the first thing to say about the Klingon Batleth is that I pointed out and actually Scal pointed out very very similar points and we came to similar conclusions. Both Scal and I have trained in HEMA for years um, and obviously we've therefore used um, long swords and pole axes and weapons like this against uh, resisting and competitive of opponents a lot and so I, in a way I don't think it's any big surprise that we came to similar conclusions and in a nutshell my conclusions I don't want to speak for Scal but my conclusions were that the backleft wasn't so bad actually I personally would make a few relatively small changes to its design I'd make it a bit longer I'd possibly make it a little bit straighter at least the end spikes uh, I'd certainly make it lighter than the listed weights uh, but by and large it's okay weapon and probably would excel in an armoured context and actually if we look at medieval Europe or indeed if we look at uh, China as well weapons designed specifically for armoured combat often fulfil different criteria and expectations for us from weapons, um, the normal weapons that we're more familiar with, typical types of swords, typical types of knives or pole arm, sometimes specialised armoured fighting weapons actually meet some of the same criteria as the Klingon Batleth seems to. And the important part here um, is that objectively, we could say according to all of the criteria that Shad sets out in his video, that a Klingon Batleth is definitely a better weapon than a stick. Um, according to all of his metrics, a Klingon Batleth comes out higher than a stick does. Now talking a little bit more about weapons in general, there are some weapons which seem suboptimal until we consider their particular context and those contexts are so massive that I'm not going to even attempt to go into them. But obviously, there's the unarmed versus sorry, unarmored versus armored uh, situation. There's mounted versus foot. There's forest versus mountain or swamp. Um, there's fighting on boats versus fighting um, in castles versus fighting in deserts. There's all different contexts, and of course, there's physical differences between people. There's fighting in large groups. There's individual dueling. There's skirmishing. There are just so many variables here that I just can't cover them all. But quite simply, all of these variables lead to weapons in the real world and therefore also in any fantasy or sci-fi world that we make up being highly diverse. And as I pointed out in my previous video on the Klingon Batleth, I pointed out that ethnographic and historical weapons from our single planet and our single species are insanely diverse. I mean, just look at all of the weapons that have been devised in India's history or just in China's history, they're massively diverse, okay? So clearly the Batleth very convincingly does sit within the parameters of something that a culture like the Klingons could have come up with. Um, and judging things as, as good or bad is so simplistic if we don't have a full global or planetary view of the context involved in how that weapon was devised, evolved, how it was used, for what purposes was it used, and so on and so forth. To give a real world comparison that viewers of my channel will be familiar with, is a cutlass objectively a better or a worse sword than a Highland basket-hilted broadsword? 
I'm not going to say it's better or worse because ultimately they're for different purposes, aren't they? The Highland basket hilted broadsword was evolved in a certain place for a certain type of fighting, for a certain type of um, culture and within a certain area. And the naval cutlass was designed for fighting on board ships with certain economic constraints and motivations. Um, it's, you know, the cutlass is single edged, the broadsword is double edged, the broadsword has a completely encased basket hilt, the cutlass has what's called a half basket. They're both one handed swords. The Highland basket hilt can, is very often used with the Taj. Just different contexts, okay? So the different contexts lead to a different design of sword. Is one better or worse? No, not really. They're just swords which are devised for different contexts. Another comparison, is the Japanese tachi, or katana if you prefer, a better or worse sword, objectively, than a Chinese dao? <laughs> They're neither better nor worse. They're just made for slightly different people, people, purposes, fighting in different ways, um, you know, against different types of armor and equipment, mounted or not mounted. They're just, again, it comes down to context. And we can pick another example. Is the European medieval hurlbat type of throwing weapon better or worse than the African um, throwing knife. Well, they're quite similar, aren't they? Is one better or worse? Well, we could look at the minutiae of the uh, materials used, the people that they might be expected to use against, or animals, perhaps sometimes. Um, uh, but by and large, they're roughly in the same ballpark, aren't they? Objectively, is a Maasai spear and shield better or worse than a Zulu spear or shield? Well, again, they're just, they're just different designs for different, slightly different purposes, thought up by different cultures. Is the Moro Chris a worse sword than a European medieval longsword? Well, we could go into, we could say, oh, the medieval European longsword is uh, longer, it has a cross guard, it can be used two-handed, um, it's perhaps got a, a blade that's stiffer, and better for thrusting. We can list all of these reasons, but it's irrelevant. That's the point here, because without context, the whole question becomes completely null and void and completely irrelevant, because fundamentally, European longswords were used in medieval Europe. The Moro Chris was used in the Philippines. They were used in completely different places at a different time by different people in different ways. And they both existed and they're both completely valid and they were both completely effective in the time and place that they were used by the people who devised them and used them. And I really feel that this which is better and which is worse really plays into, unfortunately, the modern mindset of video games, role playing games, you know, card games, things like Pokemon and stuff and top trumps of trying to like, oh, well, you may have the uh, the ZYX sword, but I have the ABS sword. So I trump you because I've got the better sword. Life doesn't work like that, I'm afraid. Neither does history or archeology span or um, anything else, really, anthropology. The fact is, different weapons, different contexts, different people, different purposes. What it's really about is the end result. And if one group of people, let's say the Mongols, used their weapons very effectively to conquer China, Boom, whatever they chose worked for them, it got the job done. Did, they, did that mean that Chinese weapons were inferior? No, there are all sorts of complicated reasons why the Mongols succeeded. Uh, and the fact is that Chinese weapons were different to Mongol weapons, even though they were sort of neighbors uh, and eventually ended up mixing and therefore there was uh, cross-pollination of the weapon types as well. But the fact is you've got different types of sword, different types of bow and spear. They evolved differently for slightly different purposes. Remember, those purposes aren't always in your power or in your choice. Very often it's down to what is available to you. So we could get into the discussion of um, Native American tomahawks. Is We could say, well, is the 18th century pipe tomahawk a better or worse weapon than the 10th century stone-headed tomahawk? It's kind of irrelevant, isn't it? It's irrelevant because the people in the 10th century didn't have access to an iron-headed um, pipe tomahawk of the 18th century. Ultimately, if we get into any discussions about what is, a, is a weapon a good weapon or a bad weapon, if we compare it with other weapons that are irrelevant to it in historical terms, if I compare a medieval longsword with a modern AR-15 rifle, does that mean that the longsword is a bad weapon? No, the longsword was a very good weapon 
in its context. The AR-15 is a very good rifle in its context and they are different separate contexts. So as regular viewers of my channel will know, for me, context is everything because that's the way I've been trained to analyze things. That's how you're trained to analyze history. I have a history degree combined with archeology. span um, And when you're an archeologist and historian, this is how you have to analyze history. When you read a source, you don't just take it at face value. You have to uh, look at bias. You have to compare it with other sources. You have to cross reference. This all boils down to context, okay? You gather in all the information you can. Now, if we bring this back to the bat lift, because I know that some of you watching this uh, video will be wanting me to talk a little bit more about the bat lift. Do I think that the bat lift is bad, a bad weapon? Objectively, no, it's not, okay? It's a type of edged pole arm, I would call it, more than a sword. Um, and clearly, if we made a batleth using even just the technology available to us, so if we made it out of 1095 steel, made it nice and sharp, I'd make it about five foot long, it would still look like a batleth. Would it be a decent weapon? Yeah, be all right. Um, and as I say, I know people in HEMA who've sparred with them and they work fairly well. They work fairly well against um, long swords, they work fairly well against pole axes. As I pointed out in my previous video, and incidentally, Scalagrim came to pretty much the same conclusions, it excels as a short-ish polearm, a bit akin to something like a short glaive or a poleaxe in an armoured fighting context. But the fact is, compared to a stick, it has edges, it can cut better, it can thrust better, it can parry better because it's kind of hooked, it's got better hand protection, it's less uh, breakable than a stick is. Um, so certainly, if fighting in armour, which would I choose, a batleth or a stick? Hell, I'd choose a batleth. Um, honestly, so long as it wasn't too heavy, uh, if it weighed about four pounds, maybe, maybe even up to five pounds with a weapon of that size, if I was fighting unarmoured, I'd probably choose a batleth over a stick as well. So, you know, even if we're comparing, making a ridiculous comparison with no context at all, just me fighting someone else one on one, I'd choose the batleth over this stick. But as I've hopefully pointed out in this video, it always comes back to context. And we don't really know the context of the Batleth and how it evolved and how it was used. And that's one of the beauty of fantasy and sci-fi weapons, because we don't necessarily need to know. We don't need to know about midichlorians. We don't, don't need to understand how the force works for it to be good in a story. We don't really need to know the background of the Batleth or the exact details of how it was used in ancient Klingon history to understand that it's an important weapon in their culture and it seems vaguely plausible and you can certainly think of ways where a weapon that looks like that would have evolved because in some ways it's not that different from some real world weapons which have actually developed in parts of our own real world, particularly China, but to some extent Europe as well. I hope this has been thought-provoking and useful. Thanks to Scalagrim for his video, and I'm really happy that he came to similar conclusions to me. And additionally, thanks to Shad for going deeper into this subject uh, and yet again making us think more about um, how we actually analyse weapons. Very interesting stuff. Thanks for watching, folks, and I hope I'll see you again soon. Cheers. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.